Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your last part of the test number six, where I will be discussing the last twenty questions in front of you. So let us get started with this particular part. But before I begin, guys, I hope you have checked out the test series so far. If you have not checked by chance, so the link is in the description below. So before you go and attempt your prelims 2024, I really and highly recommend you guys. to check out the entire series which is available at a very special price of 499 so do check out the link in description and practice the test before you go for the exam now the very first question the question number 81 which was there in your test is with respect to the ondc which stands for the open network for digital commerce so far whenever you think about the e-commerce we always have this image of amazon flipkart mintra and all these platforms that we uh, through which we do the uh, online shopping that is the that is how the e-commerce comes to our mind but there is another way of doing the e-commerce and that is when the concept of the open network for digital commerce comes in okay uh, very interestingly first of all the few things that you need to understand about this ondc and this initiative is even more important because india has a very big role in developing this particular kind of network so recently the whole concept of ondc comes into the news because some 3000 farmer producer organization fpos and 400 self help groups all and and many more micro enterprises and social sector enterprises they all registered to be a part of the ondc and when so many organizations so many groups so many entrepreneurs are registering themselves with the ondc for the for the purpose of e-commerce that means business that means something right so what is this ondc globally this is first of its kind initiative that actually aims to democratize the digital commerce world so far the digital commerce is actually dominated by a few giants like amazon walmart flipkart and all that right but but this ondc is going to break that dominance break break that monopoly and it wants to democratize the whole process of online shopping so right now what is the traditional way now normally what you and me are doing so far is the platform centric model where the between the consumer and the seller you have these platforms and these platform they charge heavy amount of commissions uh, uh, from seller if they want to sell their uh, product to the consumer but instead of this platform centric model which is very this is very uh, what you say very monopoly based very centralized model now you have an alternative which is called the ondc and all other network centric models these are platform centric see the difference between the consumer and the seller instead of these limited number of platforms you have now the open network between the consumer and the seller so you don't have to depend on these limited number of platforms you actually as a consumer you have a broad range of variety and options from where you can choose the product why only amazon flipkart and and, and other few similarly as a seller you are also not going to be dependent on any platform and as a seller you also has a wide range of variety wide range of consumer base because of this open network you can see look at this entire scenario so every seller is going to get bigger audience every consumer is going to get bigger options in terms of buying the items and that is where these network centric models are coming and the the main purpose of all these network centric model is basically to democratize the digital commerce space i hope that makes some sense to you this is really important guys and why what role india has played into that basically the ondc is an indian product ondc is initiative of the department of promotion of industry and internal trade the dpiit which which works under ministry of commerce so ondc is our initiative and in india the ondc is working as a private and non profit company this is important star mark information they may ask you is it a public company 
because it is under a ministry. Is it a public company? No, it is not. It's a private company with a non-profit kind of stuff. And the main objective is to democratize, to break the monopoly of the few digital giants. And remember, as the name says, this is an open network digital commerce. So it is an open network. Open network is basically where, where the things can be easily customized as per the options, as per the demand, as per the need. So here, the open networks like ONDCs, they are the best transitions between the buyer and the sellers and that, that totally rule out the dependence on the platforms. The, you don't really need a limited intermediaries. You need a network between the buyers and the sellers. Very like It is just like the UPI. Like you, you know that through the UPI, you can send money across to all the IDs, doesn't matter which platform. You can use UPI across phone pay, Bharat pay, Paytm, like, you know, that way. So that is the concept, that is the way because UPI has really inspired us to go into every domain with such kind of interconnectivity and that is where the ONDC kind of things have come out. And, and remember the ministry is commerce which is taking care of it. Now if you look, look at the question guys, question first second statement is absolutely okay without any problem. As you see statement number three, it, it, the statement itself is contradictory. The name says this is open network. The question says it's a closed network. Make, make any sense? Absolutely no. Straight away rule out. It, is, it cannot be closed network. The name itself is ONDC open network. So now the right answer is going to be one and two in this scenario. Okay. Now another, another clue because it is about the digital commerce, right? So which, which ministry is suitable? Ministry of Commerce. That makes sense. Oh, that is going to be correct one. Right? So the statements are quite easy. Very easy to choose the right one. Very easy to, easy to choose the, uh, the wrong one. So only two is the answer. Very easy question. And straight away you can attempt it without any problem. Now the question number 82 is, was also a very straightforward question. Very fact based but very very famous, very famous question I would say. It talks about a very famous case of Supreme Court caused the Prakash Singh versus Union of India. I'm sure you must have heard about the Prakash Singh guidelines. So as, as, as the verdict of this case, the, the, uh, the Supreme Court laid down some Prakash Singh guidelines. And Prakash Singh guidelines or Prakash Singh framework relates to which of the following? Prakash Singh case is not about homosexuality, not about defections, not about sexual harassment in the workplace. Prakash Singh guidelines is about the police reforms and functioning. This is absolutely important. Very important case. Absolutely no choice but to know about it. So straight question, easy to attempt. Let's let's uh, discuss the detail of the Prakash Singh case. That is very very important for you. So basically guys, Prakash Singh case talks about the police reform systems in India. And recently it was in news recently because of some uh, like a gangster wanted in 25 criminal cases was killed in a police encounter. So this, this uh, uh, Prakash Singh case is about like how the police should exercise their power. Uh, the, the way the police should behave and police should act within their jurisdiction. And it, it openly criticizes the extrajudicial killings of the police. Where the police or the agencies are acting in a way they should not. So basically it talks about the police system reforms. It talks about a limit on the police system it talks about like how the police should behave with the person they arrest and how the ethical things should be done so very very important case let me tell you prakash singh case is all about the uh, police reforms in india and other than that you have many such cases you have a list in front of you we have dk basu case versus state of bengal which was again on the extrajudicial killings of the of the system then you have the prakash kadam and when you have om prakash case also Prakash Kadam case also. Then you have PUCL versus state of Maharashtra. So there are many, many uh, statements. But this particular case is a pan-India famous case about the police reform. So do remember that. It's a very important question to pick up, guys. The next question is with respect to the, the Legion of Honor. The, le the Legion of Honor. And uh, uh, you have the two options. And, and you, we all have heard uh, this, this was in news very much, guys. Because uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi is the first Indian uh, premier to receive this honor. That is fine. That is absolutely correct. But, but this honor 
belongs to which country is it a greek civilian award no it's a french it's a french civilian military award that the the government of france gives to the and this is irrespective of the nationality so anybody who is in close ties with france they can get this so if you if you look at the statements guys you understand so this legion of honor is the highest french civilian military award awarded by french republic for exceptional service to france this is important regardless of the recipient nationality that's why our prime minister has got that and there are five degrees of increasing distinctions like like under the legion of honor you have the five categories one is the knight category officer commander grand officer grand cross grand cross is basically the highest level of the legion of honor this is absolutely important guys and our prime minister has got this highest distinction grand cross is what mr modi has got another interesting way our isro scientist we are uh, latit hambika even she has got this particular award for her for her engagement in space cooperation between india and france and she has got which particular award she has got this award this knight category award given to vr lathi uh, lathambika this is again very proud moment for india so if the question says which statement is not correct so clearly you have the option the first one is not correct the second one is correct not correct and the correct one so which statement is not correct so you have the answer as a only very straight forward question very straight forward so easy could have been attempted without any issue small small facts make all the difference in the prelims right next question is again very interesting category of the space missions that we have so on the on the one hand you were you were given the agencies and on the other hand uh, it talks about the asteroid like there are many asteroids there are some specific asteroids which are talk of the town because dedicatedly we have made some missions to study those particular asteroids so you have the four missions in front of you mission lucy the hayabusa mission the dawn mission and osiris rex missions it talks about what that is absolutely important guys like for example mission lucy is about the trojan asteroids osiris rex mission is about the asteroid called as bennu asteroid very famous mission second and third are correct the dawn mission is vesta and cirrus and ryugu is the hayabusa so actually here the answers first not correct the fourth not correct the right answer is 2 and 3 so only 2 is the right answer now how to attempt and all will come on that let's first understand the detail so i hope everyone every one of us are quite aware what the asteroids are i am sure this can be a question as a stand alone question also so we know what is what, what is an asteroid asteroid is nothing but a small rocky body that actually orbits around the sun like like any other planet and you know uh, if you look at the if you look at the solar system so you have the jupiter so between the jupiter and the mars between these two you have this dedicated asteroid belt you can see between these two we have this so called asteroid belt a dedicated orbit in which 90% or 95% of the asteroid they always keep revolving around the sun sun like any other uh, uh, planetary body but again there is a difference they are not planets of course they are not they are simply rocky bodies they have they have they have irregular shape they are not round like planets but asteroids are small small rocky bodies now very common difference between asteroid and a meteoroid as you have just understood that maximum 90% asteroids revolve around the sun meteoroids are also rocky bodies but they are comparatively large rocky bodies and these large rocky bodies they don't have any orbit at all without orbit they they move very randomly in the space and that's why more meteors uh, they 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 enter the more meteoroids they enter in in the atmosphere of the earth comparatively to the asteroid because asteroids are still have an orbit to revolve guys this is important i hope this is this is clear to everyone okay so here we have just uh, used a word like there are asteroid but then you will say sir asteroid is fine but what is this so called trojan asteroid trojan asteroids are that share an orbit with an, with a large planet if you have a if you have a large planet already that is moving in that particular orbit and there is one small asteroid sharing the orbit of the large planet then this particular asteroid 
is known as the Trojan asteroid. Okay, that is the difference between normal asteroid, they have their own orbit and then we have the Trojan asteroids. Okay, this is important. And then we have some, some called as the near earth asteroids. Well, near earth asteroids are those that orbit very, that their orbit very, uh, passes very close to the earth. And uh, when they close very, when they pass very close to the earth, they may become potentially dangerous for future. And some of them, uh, under the near earth category only, some are also recognized as potential destroy, uh, hazardous asteroids. Because they, in future, in future, there is a chance of collision of these asteroids with the earth. And that's why they are called potentially hazardous asteroids. So you have, and that is why, that makes sense why we are studying the asteroids. That makes sense why so many missions we have dedicatedly for the asteroids only guys. So we have got the mission uh, Lucy uh, which is by NASA and that is about exploring the, the Jupiter Trojan asteroid. So do remember this small small fact. Mission Lucy belongs to which agency? NASA. It talks about Trojan asteroid but where? The Jupiter Trojan asteroids. It is actually the first mission to explore the Jupiter Trojan asteroids. If the question comes that way, which of the following mission is the first to explore Jupiter and Trojan? The answer would be uh, mission Lucy. Then you have the Hayabusa mission 2. This is actually done by JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. And their target is to study the asteroid named as Ryugu. And they want to study the origin and evolution of the solar system by understanding and studying Ryugu. Because everything in the universe, they came more or less at the same time. So asteroids have more or less the same age as the other planets, right? And that's why studying them give us understanding about the evolution of the solar system. Then you have the mission, uh, Dawn mission, which is again by NASA. And be prepared, you may have the question in the match the following category, where mission and the agencies are also discussed. So be remembering that Dawn mission belongs to NASA and all that, right? This is important. Now, uh, the, the Dawn mission, it aims to study two out of the three proto planets that are in the in the asteroid belts that we have and we have the Vesta and the Cirrus and Vesta and Cirrus are studied as as a part of the mission Dawn. There are three proto planets between the asteroid in the asteroid belt. The third is Pallas but of course the Pallas are not studied as a part of Dawn. Dawn is only two the Vesta and Cirrus. Let me tell you guys, Cirrus is also uh, is what you call as a, as a dwarf planet. Cirrus is also a dwarf planet that we have. Right? Like, like we have, the, there are few, uh, there are five dwarf planets, right? So one is Cirrus, one is our Pluto. Pluto is also a dwarf planet now. One is uh, Make Make, one is Homia. So all these are uh, dwarf planets that we have. Now, Another mission that was mission Osiris Rex. This is again important. If you if you look at the mission, this is this this is again by USA. This is again by NASA. So this is the first US mission uh, that is done by NASA. Of course, uh, Osiris Rex. The the purpose is to collect a sample from the asteroid, and which asteroid it is going to target? Target asteroid is Bennu. So this mission for the first time going to the Bennu, collecting the samples, and then it returned also. Yes. In 2023, this mission has returned with all the samples required. But the spacecraft did not land. It continued on no new mission. It got the samples from Bennu, came back and then went again. So right now the Osiris is now exploring another asteroid called as the Apophis. Right now it is, it is exploring the Apophis. So you remember the two asteroids associated with Osiris Rex. This is why we are studying the Opophis. Opophis is study because it's a near object, near earth object. And we really want to know if that can be potentially dangerous in future or not. And this um, of um, the Opophi Opophis, it is associated between the same asteroid belt between Jupiter and the Mars. So now you have every option in front of you, right? So I hope, of course, of course, this mission is a pure fact based question you really have very less scope of the guessworks. The answer is clearly two, that is B, B2 only. But I would say this particular question was still a tough question. You, you need to skip if you are not aware of the missions. 
because it's it is purely fact based tell me what logic you can apply there is absolutely no logic so do read about the asteroid and the asteroid missions at least those which were in news in the last 12 months to 18 months so do read do have a reading on that this this may be important guys now the next one we have is the question number 85 the question number 85 talks about with reference to climate change performance index called the ccpi this is important again this climate change performance index and let me tell you this is going to be a challenging question i'll tell you why this question talks about which statements are correct about the climate change performance index ccpi so if you look at the statements you will be shocked to see that why see this ccpi this uh, this particular climate change performance index since it is an index the first thing you have to look is which has published it forget about anything climate change performance index relates to published annually by what by green by the german watch number one german watch then you have the new climate institute and climate action network so these are the three names you need to remember that relates to the climate change performance index and this ccpi it evaluates the climate mitigation efforts of the 63 countries and the european union that is the purpose why this index was prepared this index was aiming so that the countries can get to know how they are performing in terms of climate change and how their policies are doing how what efforts they are putting up for their climate change efforts and why only the 63 countries because 63 countries that were chosen under the ccpi are actually responsible for 90 percent greenhouse gases so that that make every possible logic that make every sense why these 63 countries were chosen guys and when it comes to the assessment under the ccpi each country's performance is actually assessed based on the four categories and these categories include the the highest weightage given to greenhouse gas emissions 40 percent weightage then how the countries are doing with the renewable energy how the country is doing with respect to energy use and the climate policy so these are the four categories you may have a question coming this way also they will they will they will ask you which of the following are the categories or the parameters under ccpi so be prepared with that also and right now it is very important to know that this particular assessment this particular index has clearly mentioned that overall there is no country that is doing satisfactory efforts with respect to climate change and that is why the first three ranks were kept as empty because there is absolutely no country doing 100 percent what they need to do for the climate change so the ranking of this time 2023 rankings started from denmark denmark being at number four then estonia being number five and philippines being number six but the first three ranks totally blank and this is a signify this is this is basically to signify this is basically to bring the attention that no country can claim that they are doing the best possible for climate change what about india india is ranked at seven guys so of course if india has been ranked you must be focusing on the rank of india so india is number seven as per the ccpi of 2024 please remember each and every information that i am sharing with you it is absolutely very very important if you look at the question you see there are so many problems because we have just understood as the ccpi says denmark is number one it is not it is number four because first one is first three are empty so clearly not cannot be the answer it says india ranking is number four it is denmark at number four india is at number seven so sometimes you also need to remember the ranking of india if india is doing exceptionally well or if india is doing exceptionally poor in both scenario both categories you try you must remember the ranking of india so second is also wrong fourth is all, sorry third is wrong fourth is wrong what about the second one the second one is again wrong because here you need to remember the three names for the index and clearly world meteorological organization wmo was not a part of it right you you remember the three names guys so only first statement is correct so answer is only one now how to how to eliminate these kind of things of course this was a 
this was a tough question i told you this was a tough one uh, but but since you have some scope you have some scope of the guesswork and clearly clearly at least you can see india is not in top 5 anywhere with respect to climate change you know you must know this fact so cannot be the the correct way so here in this particular case i think uh, you can uh, you can at least take little bit of risk because depending on the on the uh, information that you know from the options if you don't know everything then still the options are not that difficult and something that you can you can uh, talk about you can guess about so in this case yeah little bit risk can be taken try to eliminate the options at least try to be sure which cannot be the right one at least try to eliminate that part next question number 80 86 is with respect to a species now which of the following species are the one that was that recently being rediscovered in the south africa which which uh, uh, which was declared extinct 87 years ago but now this species is being rediscovered in south africa which one is the one so how to solve this question this is purely and purely fact based question absolutely no guess work you can't do any guess in that how would you do the guess work so tough skip it if you do not know it what is the right answer right answer is supposed to be a so we have recently rediscovered the blind golden mole and now since we are discussing i have to give you the idea basic basic idea about the all the four species you never know what comes in your upcoming exam so remember guys so look at this this is the blind golden mole and this particular species has recently rediscovered in south africa 87 years after it was declared extinct so now the status has been given as critically endangered these blind golden moles are mammal species which are endemic to south africa remember that and mainly they they live uh, in the habitats which are subtropical dry shrublands mediterranean type shrubby vegetations these are their favorite spots any time you think of any biodiversity my humble suggestion iucn status remembering the iucn status is probably the most critical part the most important part and many times the question will come as a match the following kind of stuff that is important clear okay now talking about the green turtle the second category so green turtle is of course you must remember this fact and this is again important green turtles one of the largest sea turtles that we have and they are the only herbivore among different species this is again interesting fact that you need to know about these green turtles now they are named greenish because of the cartilage and the fat not their shells remember that also uh, in the eastern pacific region you have we have a group of green turtles and they have darker shells and that's why sometimes they are also called as black turtles by the local community where you find these green turtles they are mainly find uh, they are mainly found in the tropical and subtropical water mainly in the in the waters of atlantic uh, ocean gulf of mexico argentina mediterranean indo pacific so these are the few but not just the few of course they are quite widely spread in india do we find them yes sir this 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 point is very important for you anything that relates to india becomes important so in india we find these green turtles in andaman nicobar lakshadweep tamil nadu gujarat and the maharashtra so all these coastal areas we have the presence of that iucn status is endangered for these they are they are still still not into that problem but of course endangered itself is a huge category guys then you have another option called as java uh, stingari java stingari is nothing but it became the first marine fish that has recently become extinct so you may have a question why i am discussing that because you may have a question coming on any of these species because every species was in news for some reason or the other so java stingari recently became the first marine fish that now is officially as per the iucn it is now extinct it used to be found only very near to the java island but now it's extinct guys why why it got extinct heavy fishing pressure and habitat degradation you may have mcq coming on that also so remember that the reasons why this this fish 
has become extinct recently and then you have very uh, very interesting uh, category called the painted stalk which is nothing but a shore bird you find the painted uh, uh, stalk the shore birds endemic to indian subcontinent and southeast asia so this entire area that you can see on your map you have the presence of this beautiful small little bird iocn status is near threatened so as of now it's out of that risk kind of zone okay remember that please question number 87 now very important and interesting question the question says the question is talking about the ketamine i hope everyone knows about the ketamine it's a it's a drug that we use in some treatments recently other than the medical use of ketamine people have reported that some people are using the ketamine for some notorious purpose why what why it is related to what it relates to Kya, what is this ketamine is it a is it a kind of uh, is, is it a weapon in chemical warfare absolutely no a, a chemical warfare is not used as a medical purpose right then is it is it is it is it relates to performance enhancing drugs in the sports no uh, is it about treating addiction to other substances no recently ketamine has caused concern because ketamine is being misused as a recreational drug done for the fun purposes to get that high in the recreation zone so as as other drugs like cocaine heroin and all now recently ketamine is being used as a recreational drug and that is this misused has caused concern in the medical community about the ketamine so answer has to be a straightforward question easy very easy to attempt what you need to know about ketamine please learn it with me right now so this ketamine is nothing but this is actually uh, used in the ana, uh, the uh, anesthetic purposes so mainly mainly uh, this ketamine uh, drug which is an anesthetic basically it is used for the treatment of the mental illness because using this ketamine actually it is it is classified as a hallucinogen by the US drug department so basically that is why it gives you hallucinations what is real what is not real sometimes becomes difficult and for that purpose for hallucination purpose only people normally do the drugs so the recreational drugs have this ultimate goal of hallucination and that is where the cat somebody has discovered that ketamine being anesthetic is giving the same kind of dope giving same kind of hallucination normally used for the treatment of the mental illness but unfortunately used as recreational drug it is only for inducing pleasure and alter one state you you never know you may have a you may have a question about define recreational drug so recreational drug means what a drug a medicine something that gives me pleasure as as a mental pleasure or it, it is capable of altering my state of mind even in recreational drug category there are some types guys even recreational drugs can be of three types it can be stimulant can be depressant can can be hallucinogen stimulants are basically they increase the alertness and energy for example cocaine A anybody takes cocaine he becomes more alert more energetic similarly you have the uh, the meth uh, meth ephetamine or, or the caffeine the normal why do why do people drink black coffee drinking black black coffee has caffeine so any anything that has caffeine makes you alert makes your energy level spike then you have another drugs called as depressants where they produce they are not going to make you energetic or alert they are going to soothe on you they are going to produce the calm effect for example alcohol why people have this drink and relax have you ever seen people drinking and become energetic and that no normally people people are using marijuana or alcohol they simply get relaxed and you know they because this, these these depressants they have a calming effect and then you have something called as halluc uh, hallucinogens they they are the they are the real uh, uh, you know drugs i mean they are the one getting all that you you are not in a state of understand what is real what is not real all the hallucinations will come uh, like like one of my friend was telling me there was uh, like a person after getting some lsd or something he simply saw a small mouse in the house and for that person that mouse was not this much 
he described later the mouse was as big as the house that was the kind of hallucination so all these lsd drug the dmt and all these kind of things are hallucinogen and now the ketamine also falls in this particular category okay this is important guys Okay, now that brings us to the next question, number 88. Now, how many of the organizations are exempted from the Right to Information Act? This is important, guys. Right to Information Act is coming in the question again and again. But this time, I'm not going to discuss what all RTI covers. But the question is about what all is exempted from the jurisdiction of the RTI. Okay, and let me let me put it in a very simple manner. Anything which is of national security, anything that has to do something with, with intelligence. Why why some organizations are exempted? There are there are almost 22 organizations that are being exempted. Where RTI, you can't simply file an RTI and ask, okay, tell me about the raw of India. That is not possible. We can't give you the intelligence information, right? So clearly. Some informations are not to be meant made public and every and any organization that is there to protect the secrecy of that information or about the security of India are not going to share information with the public. So except in this particular case, except this PMO because PMO is actually covered. It comes under the RTI. You, you may file an RTI to know about the information from PMO office. That is fine. But other than that, look at this is a this is intelligence unit. So of course cannot be covered as a part of RTI. The CBI, CBI is again investigation, cannot be covered as a part of RTI. Even the CERT, the computer emergency response team, the CERT in, which is the first, which is the nodal body for the cyber attacks of India, they are also not going to be covered. Very logical sense. Why something is not going to be covered as the RTI? Because that information may have some other importance. That's why uh, it is not shareable under the RTI, right? So that way, if you see, out of the four, only three is the right answer. I I'll tell you the whole list, guys. But here, only three. Very easy question. Very easy to attempt. Just you need to understand why something could be exempted from the RTI. So we know about the RTI a lot. This, uh, this right is a sensational tool that empowers the citizens of India using the act the citizen feel very empowered because now they can access the information that was initially under the control of public authorities before it is not like that for the first time in india we got this act only solving giving uh, citizens the power no before the rti there was a there was an act called as freedom of information act 2002 right and um, not 22 sorry i was saying 22 no there are 27 organizations Please just correct my, uh, correct, correct my uh, information or 22, but 27 organizations that are being exempted under the purview of the RTI and latest, latest uh, exemption is given to the CERT in India about the cyber security. And you have this all list in front of you. Think of anything and everything, anything, everything which is sensitive, important for security, intelligence, everything is going to be exempted. So all this information bureau, the raw, the directorate of revenue intelligence, directorate of enforcement, ED, and all the, the defense services, everything is outside, including the financial intelligence unit. Then we have the SPG, which is responsible for protection, giving security to the prime minister. So everything, you have this entire list, you can, you can pause the video here and you can see. All these, in total, there are 27 organizations exempted from the RTI. In these particular organizations, the RTI cannot be filed or processed. Next question we have is with respect to the Kigali Agreement. Very, very landmark, very landmark agreement. Whenever you are preparing for the environment or you're preparing for international relation, do not forget to prepare about Montreal and Montreal Protocol, which was, which was signed way back in 1984 and came into being in 1987 the amendment to the montreal is the kigali amendment now what makes kigali so special we'll talk about that first you need to know uh, a couple of facts about the kigali agreement guys so recently 
uh, when 28th meeting of the parties happened in 2016, uh, that was a conference of party to the Montreal Protocol. So Montreal Protocol, the background I told you, na? It, it was in 1984 and uh, by 86 and by 87, the things got implemented. What was the Montreal Protocol, guys? I'm sure everyone knows about Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol is the first treaty that banned the ozone depleting substances. Montreal Protocol is about the banning of ozone depleting substances. It talks about, this protocol talks about the ozone hole. We need to fill up the ozone hole, the ozone thilling. And for that purpose, all substances that are going to deplete the ozone are banned. And especially which particular? The chlorofluorocarbons, for example. So all these were banned. But at the same time, when the ozone depleting substances were banned, the this protocol actually gave an alternative in 19, uh, 1990s uh, when when people asked that what is the alternative of the uh, chlorofluorocarbons because ultimately these CFCs and all na, they are they are used as uh, refrigerants they are used as coolants in industrial systems so of course some alternative needs to be given so that time Montreal Protocol banned chlorofluorocarbons but allowed the hydrofluorocarbons the HFCs they were allowed as a replacement of the CFC. But then later we realized, okay, fine, HFCs, they are safe for the ozone, no doubt. They are safe for the ozone. But there is another problem with the HFCs and that is the hydrofluorocarbons are actually greenhouse gases. They are doing this global warming and this global warming has become a new problem for us. So now, now to, to make some changes in the Montreal Protocol, so in, uh, in 2016, we come up with an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And this amendment to the Montreal Protocol was done in Kigali. So tell me, uh, okay, in the comment section, tell me, Kigali is the capital of which country? Can you tell me, guys? Kigali relates to which country? Tell me in the comment section box if you can. Now, now uh, understanding the role of the hydrofluorocarbons in global warming. So now this Kigali amendment was done, signed by 197 nations, which is, which is a record in itself. Now the parties who have signed this Kigali agreement or Kigali amendment, amendment to Montreal Protocol. Now, of course, uh, the chlorofluorocarbons are still going to be banned. But now we are also cracking down on the hydrofluorocarbons. Under this agreement, it is expected to reduce the manufacture and use of the hydrofluorocarbons. And how we are going to reduce it? We are aiming to cut th those by nearly 80-85%. That is our target of cutting it. Now from their respective baselines uh, till 2045. So now this Kigali amendment is all about the cutting and cracking down the hydrofluorocarbons because they are responsible for global warming and and very interestingly this Kigali amendment is going to be legally binding yes you can't uh, uh, escape from the from the implementation it is a legally binding agreement between the between the signatory parties and the law and compliance and now this Kigali arrangement has been uh, under effect since 2019 1st January 2019 it is it is it is being operational Guys. So now if you come back, if you, you, if you come back, so tell me which statement is correct and which statement is not correct. So talking about the uh, Kigali, first statement is correct. Yes, we have just understood. Kigali amendment is nothing but the amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Makes sense? Yes, true. 2016, we, um, uh, we uh, talk about 19, it got implemented. But there is problem with the st second statement. Second statement is not correct. Tell me, Kigali amendment, is it about banning CFC? No, CFCs, they were already banned in Montreal Protocol. Hi the Kigali is about hydrofluorocarbons. So the statement one is right, but two is incorrect. So right answer has to be C in this case. Very simple question, easily, because chlorofluorocarbon, Montreal Protocol, ozone depletion are very common topics. But now you know what, what particular relation you need to remember 
between the Kigali and the Montreal Protocol. The next question is question number 90. Talks about the elephant corridors and the reserves. Now the first, now there are four statements that you need to take care of. So and I am sure we all are aware, aware about the elephant corridors, right? So let's try to understand what elephant corridors and reserves are all about and what we need to learn from the exam perspective. So please remember the first thing is first the definition. What is an elephant corridor? It is nothing but a linear path that actually helps the elephant movement between the two habitats. So elephant sometimes going to live at this part, sometimes going to live at that part. So basically what we do in elephant corridor, we are simply sparing some path that connects the different habitats of the elephant so that the movement can be done easily without any problem. As of now, as per the Ministry of Environment data, there are 150 elephant corridors across the 15 elephant range states. This information is important from the question point of view. Remember that. Why do we create elephant corridors? Number one, genetic diversity. Because ultimately when you are, when you are helping elephants to move and helping elephants to move means they are going to meet some other elephants. There will be intermingling and cross breeding between the elephants of one area and the other area. So of course the genetic diversity is going to be there in future generations of elephant, number one. Number two, it reduces animal human conflict because you know when you are creating a dedicated corridor, so you know the humans also know, oh this is an elephant corridor. We must no go this path or we must not, not try to in, uh, enter this area because there would be elephants in this area. So clearly there would be less human animal conflict. Otherwise, if there are no dem demarcated areas, how would I know the elephant? This is your elephant way, or how would elephant know this is not my way? This is your highway. So the, that that's why the demarcation is important. As of now in India, there are 33 elephant reserves, and 33 elephant reserves in India are spread across the 10 elephant landscape in 14 states. And I recommend all of you guys to please practice the 33 elephant reserves please please uh, kya, kya bolte hai? please uh, do practice about uh, these 33 on the map and that too physical map i want you to remember to to know the name of the elephant reserve and the state in which it belongs i'm not saying remember all 33 but at least try to remember the recent ones at least try to remember the last 5 or the latest five elephant reserves. At least this much I expect from you guys. This, this is important. And for the practice purpose, you don't worry. You don't have to go anywhere. For the practice purpose, we have this entire whole big thing in front of you. So yes, using this, these are the 33 elephant reserves that we have. So all you have to do is nothing, but simply you need to practice it once and do talk about the, the latest ones. But please remember one thing, one thing is important. When you talk about elephant reserves, when talking about elephant corridors, they are very important for the administrative classification, fine. But remember one thing, the elephant corridor or reserves, they do not promise a greater protection to the elephant habitats. Why? Because they are not recognized by the law. They are not covered uh, under any solid legislation. They are not a part of any law. That's why definitely for administrative purposes they help a lot. But are they really solving the problem? Are they really promising the protection to the elephant habitats? No. Because they are not covered under any law. And as a result, government sometimes can also divert these reserves for various other development projects. And that makes the vulnerability a real challenge. So if you look at the whole statements, you have some statements as wrong. For example, first statement not correct. Why? We just have understood there are 105. There are 150 elephant corridors that we have. Second, third correct. But fourth again not correct because it says elephant corridors promise greater protection. No, they do not protect, uh, guarantee any protection. They are not recognized by the law. I definitely agree. This question is very much dependent on the facts. Of course, there are some guesswork that you guys can do 
बट ऑफ कॉल लाइक फॉर एग्जाम्पल सेकेंड स्टेटमेंट इज वेरी लॉजिकल है ना बट अगेन द प्रॉब्लम इज हाउ वुड यू आइडेंटिफाइड इज वन जीरो फाइव और वन फिफ्टी सो प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड दिस 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 कॉन्ट क्वेश्चन लुक ईजी समटाइम्स बट यू वेन यू एक्चुअली स्टार्ट सॉल्विंग हाउ डू यू नो दैट इन इंडिया देर आर फिफ्टीन एलिफेंट रेंज स्टेट्स ओनली हाउ वुड यू नो दैट देर आर टेन एलिफेंट लैंडस्केप विद फोर्टीन स्टेट हाउ यू रिमेंबर द थर्टी थ्री इज द राइट नंबर सो दिस क्वेश्चन इज टू मच डिपेंडेंट ऑन द फैक्ट इट्स हेविली डिपेंडेंट ऑन द फैक्ट and that's why the question is tough and i would not recommend you to attempt it like like a normal one only attempt if you know the answer other than better to skip rather than taking a risk because it is heavily dependent on the facts that is important that you need to remember guys clear be one that brings us to the next very simple question we are doing it for so so many times we know there are different different types of hydrogen now the world is talking about hydrogen hydrogen is considered to be the fuel of future and there are many color coding with the hydrogen that we associate so the question says the kind of hydrogen that you produce by splitting the water into hydrogen and oxygen using the electrolysis where the energy in the electrolysis is produced by renewable what is the name that we give to that kind of hydrogen the right answer is the green hydrogen and that is what we are doing it for so many times green hydrogen is everyone talking about very simple question very easy but then you should also know sir then what are the other codings of the hydrogen we know about the very basics the question is very simple so how do you produce a green hydrogen so this is my water inside the water i am going to pass the electric current in the water the h2o there is already hydrogen there is always oxygen so the moment i am going to pass my electric current inside the water the water will break into the hydrogen ions and the oxygen ions and this hydrogen that i am going to extract from that break is going to be my fuel hydrogen but but that depends now the question says okay now you have used the electricity you have used the electrolysis process to break the water but the question is how would you how have you produced that electricity if that electricity was produced by let's say some fossil fuel or that electricity you have prepared by using some renewable energy or some other kind of energy or nuclear energy if it was produced using the renewable energy especially the solar and the wind that elect that hydrogen is going to be called as green hydrogen if it is done using let's say a uh, coal if the electricity is based on the coal then it will be called as a black hydrogen or a brown hydrogen if the natural gas was used to prepare the electricity it would be called as a gray hydrogen understand so these are or or if nuclear was the source then it would be called as a pink hydrogen so basically the color coding itself signifies that what kind of energy source we have used what source of energy source we have used for producing the hydrogen and you have the whole list in front of you the different different colors of hydrogen and the sources from which it is made the yellow one if the question says the yellow hydrogen hydrogen produced by electrolysis using the grid electricity from uh, from a mixture of renewable and fossil fuel then it is to be called as yellow and white hydrogen is what white hydrogen produced only as a by product of industrial process you are not making hydrogen deliberately hydrogen is simply a by product of the industrial processing okay and this is considered to be a very rare kind of form this is a very rare kind of hydrogen that happens so you have all this list in front of you that i told if it is nuclear it is pink if it is renewable it is green if it is produced by fossil fuels right uh, it can be blue also if the carbon is captured and used as a re uh, reused later but if it is only extracting the gas using the natural gas or steam based uh, kind of that is that is a gray one guys okay important and if if uh, you have got the hydrogen by splitting by thermal splitting of uh, methane that is going to be called as turquoise so my purpose is to tell you this is this is a very basic topic that is there in the news for so many times okay uh, and do prepare about green hydrogen every time you are preparing for exam do read about green hydrogen and the best part of green hydrogen is it releases no carbon by products once you burn green hydrogen 
only water and water vapor are the remnants so practically giving you no pollution at all okay question number 92 this question is about the lentana or called the lentana camara very tough question a very heavily fact based question going to test the nerve of your current affairs and you have to figure out which statement is not correct about the lantana kamara let's first learn about this and then we'll come back so basically what is this lantana lantana as you can see in front of you lantana is nothing but an invasive species and iucn has classified lantana as the top 100 invasive species of the world you know the meaning of invasive i told you many times invasive are those species they do not belong to this area originally they came from some other environment got adjusted and start reproducing as a massive rate becomes invasive for the for the local vegetation so this lantana the, its native its original original belonging is central and south america from there and again it was done by britisher britishers has not just uh, ruined our country in terms of the colonial rule but they have also ruined our natural vegetations the britishers has introduced lantana as an ornamental plant but but now right now look at the look at the scenario 40 percent of india's forest land is covered by lantana including the tiger reserves and lantana invaded most of the pastures in the country so the way it is spreading is very dangerous guys it is a very dangerous invasive species that we have understood in fact this so called lantana kamara it, it is actually considered to be toxic for the livestock if by chance your livestock eat it as a part of their food it becomes it becomes toxic for the livestock as well where it can cause the liver damage in the in the livestock understood but again it's very difficult to get rid of that you cut it cut it keep cutting it keep growing it becomes really difficult to uh, you know get rid of the lantana kamara important guys okay and yeah one more one more interesting thing that you need to remember so uh, now the people of uh, india they are also using lantana the dried lantana stems are also used to fence their fields or sometimes they are used to burn them as a charcoal only why this lantana leaves can be used for antimicrobial fungicidal and insecticidal properties as well so these are the relevance of lantana that how the local people are using it okay now when it comes to the removal guys yeah when it comes to removal um, uh, of course, it's difficult to remove lantana it's being an invasive species, but there are mechanical control of lantana can be done. Me mechanical control, you literally have to go physically keep cutting everything. But again, that process is quite, uh, it can be effective, but it is very, very labor intensive, very, very uh, uh, expensive activity. So now if you look at the question, okay, the question says, which statement is not correct about the lantana? Here, all the four statements. Since you have read it with me, you see, it is invasive, yes. Native area is correct, check. So dried lantana used as in the field and at the charcoal, check. And the remains, uh, the lantana is a challenge for uh, the removal part. So yeah, all four are absolutely correct. The which statement is not correct, answer is supposed to be D because all are correct. How would you identify this question? Again, very heavily dependent on information. Very specifically, you need to know very less work of uh, of the of the guesswork is there becomes a really tough question you can take a risk if you are in a position to eliminate a few otherwise you can skip this question uh, because it's a difficult one and likely chances are you are going to end up doing some mistake guys the next question that we have is about the traditional toys and the state very important question which statements are correct again this is also 200 percent fact based absolutely no scope of guesswork i find it tough because it's a very it's a one one go kind of question you know it you know it you don't know it you don't know it only you can solve this question if you have already read them before the exam there is no strategy no technique what you can imply uh, apply because it's a pure fact based questions 
so if you look at the look at the options that we have and and let me tell you guys let me let me remind you talking about the traditional toys is very important these days in fact after the pradhan mantri has mentioned the traditional toys in his speech couple of times now upsc can actually target question on the traditional toys so my suggestion is when you are preparing art and culture do read about the traditional toys very very important so if you look at the traditional toys so we have toys called as the konda palli that belongs to the state of andhra the kanya putri dolls belongs to bihar the uh, the uh, bahatuk bahatuk ali belongs to maharashtra and the channa patna belongs to karnataka channa patna are very much in the news also recently because because now uh, even in afghanistan they are very popular these the channa patna toys they have become part of children academic activities in afghanistan and that was that is why it was in news and you never know upsc can pick up this information anytime so this this uh, channa patna toys they are nothing but a wooden toys as you can see in front of you channa patna is a wooden toys they are dolls manufactured in karnataka especially the the uh, raman raman gar district and there are some features also why what are what are the major features of these toys guys these toys are 100% chemical free in fact in 2005 the the channa patna toys they also received the geographical indication tag so these toys are even more special again of course you have to remember all but do remember the fourth one the fourth one is exceptionally important for the exam so now you have the list in front of you right so you have the options in front of you just other than the baha uh, the uh, baha tukli toys in maharashtra other than this all are wrong because it is the kanya putri dolls which are in bihar the chenna patna toys they belong to karnataka and konda palli belongs to andhra maybe the local people can solve this question easily but if you do not belong to any of the states then things really become difficult for you to attempt so answer is only one i would say tough question really take a risk only if you have read it otherwise you need to to you need to skip rather than taking the risk okay ji chalo next question again very interesting next question is about the bhartiya nagrik suraksha sahita recently let me tell you guys that the government of india has recently replaced the three laws in india very big reforms indian penal code the criminal the criminal procedure code and the india evidence act these three acts which were which were very very old acts most of them they be, they belong to the pre independence era they were the colonial laws now the government has scrapped these old laws and replace them with the new laws that we have got and one of them is called bhartiya nagrik suraksha sahita so clearly i mentioned there is there is absolutely no change on civil procedure code bhartiya nagriya surakshak sahita is about the crpc not the cpc it talks about criminal procedure code so at least first is wrong you know that the very special thing and very attractive thing that we have put in this in the latest criminal procedure co code called the bhartiya nagrik sahita is that now there is a time limit on the police to file the charge sheet in any case within 90 days the best part is now to fast track the process to actually put pressure on the police so that they can do the work little bit faster so within 90 days the charge sheet needs to be filed so as to deliver the quick justice and in if in some cases some special cases if it is required another 90 days can be granted but that grant that permission you need to take from the court itself so here the second statement is correct but first is not correct the answer is supposed to be b simple question straight away straight forward question and since you 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 are preparing for the upcoming prelims talking about all the three latest laws that we have got you have no choice but to talk about it so this bhartiya nagrik suraksha sahita replace the code of criminal procedure remember that and why see look at the criminal procedure code that we were following so the last one that we got was in 1973 right so definitely it was changed guys 
अनादर क्वेश्चन वी हैव इज भारतीय न्याय संहिता अनादर क्वेश्चन सो दिस भारतीय न्याय संहिता इज इज द रिप्लेसमेंट ऑफ द इंडियन पिनल कोड व्हिच वाज फॉर्मुलेटेड इन 1860 सो बीएनएस रिटेन्स द प्रोविजन ऑफ द आईपीसी दैट क्रिमिनलाइजेस द एक्ट्स लाइक मर्डर अबेटमेंट सुसाइड कॉजिंग हीनियस क्राइम यस डोंट थिंक दैट वी हैव वी हैव चेंज्ड और वी हैव शिफ्ट something very big no i mean 90% of the content is the same in the old laws and the new laws 90% of the material is same only names have been changed few provisions have been added few have uh, have been removed for example the uh, the bharti nyay sahita removed the office offense of sedition sedition was a very draconian law as article 124a under the ipc but now in the bharti nyay sahita there is no sedition offense but that does not mean you have the liberty to say anything to the government no if some things have been removed some restrictions have been put and for that matter you need to little bit discuss about the bharti nyay sahita let me tell you why i'm discussing and spending time on that because this statement is absolutely important this question is absolutely important so bharti nyay sahita it largely retains the provisions of the ipc of course some offenses being removed some being added like for example uh, it retains the provisions of the ipc like uh, ipc criminalizes act like murder abetment of suicide and all these are still offenses and crimes let me tell you there is one very special thing that has happened to the bharti nyay sahita indian penal code has nowhere mentioned the acts of terrorism but bharti nyay sahita actually added terrorism as a legally recognized offense and that is why that is why now you can crack down more heavily on terrorism because you have a law that deals with definition of the terrorism guys so that bharti nyay sahita has added this uh, terrorism as an offense okay the, i hope you got it guys so it, it this this particular bharti nyay sahita says terrorism means what terrorism is any activity that threatens the unity integrity security economic security of the country terrorism is also as per the legal definition it is an activity to strike terror in the people or any section of people in india that is that is important guys now under this new bharti nyay sahita i told you it removed the offense of sedition because that sedition used to be considered very colonial in nature but you know instead of that the government has put the same kind of stuff but with a different name so it says it says the government is going to give you punishment if you are going to do any of these things if if your activities are with respect to the armed rebellion if your activities are with respect to secession if you are trying to encourage the feelings of separatist activities in india if you are trying to endanger the sovereignty unity integrity of india then you will be punished so though the word sedition been dropped but you know somehow the soul of the sedition is still there and still going to haunt us for the long time okay important so here and yeah very interestingly so far so far for the first time only even mob lynching has been considered as a part of bharatiya nyay sahita guys so if you look at the statements all statements you will find absolutely correct in this domain so yeah all four correct but like i'm telling you again and again do read about bharti nyay sahita do read about bhartiya suraksha sahita do read about the bhartiya uh, uh, the uh, indian evidence act replacement right the bhartiya sakshatar adhiniyam so that is again very important so in this question the question was very straight forward i mean yeah how how to solve it for that only this question was only for those people they have actually read this information in advance otherwise it becomes really tough to guess that what has probably has happened what has not happened what what's been added what's been not added so yeah you can take a risk depending on uh, how much you are in a position to solve or eliminate but again be careful with this kind of questions now the next question we have is uh, with the uh, question number 96 that we have so question 96 what it what does it says now this question is again with respect to the same lineage it says the parliament recently passed three criminal laws yes sir replacing all these 
Yes, sir. First is correct. Second says the new laws will not retain any provision from the predecessor. Doesn't it look very, very uh, exaggeration? Is it possible? Of course, there was not everything was wrong in the in the earlier laws. That is not the case. And if you are trying to replace the laws all together want to start from scratch, it will actually lead to very logistic problems. It will lead to discontinuity of the justice. So, of course, we are not going to change all the provisions. Maximum provisions are retained. So, clearly number two is wrong. You need to eliminate it right here. And then the third statement says, the Bhartiya Sakshya Adhiniyam replaces Evidence Act. So, very obvious, simple sa question, simple sa statement. First and three being correct and second being incorrect. Easy question, could have been attempted without any problem. So, in so you, you have just have seen, there's three questions back to back. So, please, I humbly suggest you, do expect MCQs coming on the three bills. And that's why you need to at least read them and prepare them in detail, guys. This is important, okay? Question number 97. You are given some of the schemes, some of the bodies, some of the portals. So we have the PM Shri, Nishtha, Ullas, PM E Vidya, and the Parak. How many of these initiatives, very specifically the question says, how many of these initiatives are taken under new education policy of 2020? I know all the five, all the five belong to education field, fine, no problem. But the question is not that. But the question is, how many of the five that belongs to education, they were initiatives under the new education policy. So that you need to know and for that purpose you need to study and talk about the new education policy also. So you know in 2020 the government of India has made a big change. And that change was the national education policy that was introduced in India that actually replaced. Before that, we used to, we used to have the education policy of 1986. So almost after 34 years, the government of India has changed the education policy. And now this new education policy aims to make education even more flexible, even more holistic. And our main purpose is to unlock the student's unique potential. We really want to make our education more practical. And for that purpose, the new education policy was introduced. This entire policy is based on five foundation pillars. This can be asked in MCQ as well. The five pillars of education policy of India. Access, education should be accessible. Accessible should be available equally for all. Should be quality education. Needs to be light on my pocket. Should be affordable and accountable as well. So these are the five. Remember, this is absolutely star gold mark. So these are the five foundational uh, pillars of the new education policy. And under that, we have got n number of initiatives. Forget about these. We have all these initiatives are under new education policy. We have got the PM Shri, which is Prime Minister's School for Rising India. This is all about upgraded, upgradation of the school. Then we have got the Nipun Bharat initiative. It talks about the national uh, initiative for proficiency in reading with understanding and uh, numeracy. Then we also got the PME Vidya, which is nothing but the digital on-air education platform. Diksha, which talks about digital infrastructure for knowledge sharing as one nation, one digital platforms. We also have updated the national curriculums. We also have started a Jadui Pitara for the children between, the, uh, between th three and eight years of age. And it also talks about national curriculum. And there are so, so many things, guys, so many. Even Ullas that we are talking, yes, India has got Ullas. Ullas is nothing but New India Literacy Program. That is called Ullas. That is also there. And Nishtha, even Nishtha portal has relation with the new education policy. Nishtha talks about national initiative for school head and teacher holistic advancement. This is nothing but an integrated teacher training program for different school education teachers. So if you look at the question again, you will find, sir, all the five are the right answer. The right answer needs to be D, all five. We just have seen. So this is absolutely important that you that you need to prepare, especially with the landmark education policies like them or any other government policy which are landmark or you consider them landmark, do read about the initiatives that are being taken in their name. Now, what was the question easy? 
I would say it was a medium level question that you, you could have taken the risk. Why? Look at the names. The names are important. If you are in a position to connect the name with the education policy, you may, you may be in a position to solve it. Okay, so that way you can you can approach this question. Now we have got question number 98 guys. Question 98 is about the national mensural hygiene policy. Very important. For a second, let's see, let's see. You have not read the national mensural hygiene policy. Let's say you do not know about it. Fine. Think in a very general terms. Why? Do we make a mensural hygiene policy? What could be the aim? Very first, very logical explanation. Ensuring mensurating women and girls have safe hygiene, hygienic quality, mensural products, sanitation facilities, yes. Most logical aim. Creating enabling environment for people including women, girls, men, boys to have access to correct information, mensuration. Absolutely. Very logical. Without information, without the correct. And let me tell you. When, when it comes to any gender sensitive topics, we make this mistake where we uh, try to think that the gender based discrimination or gender based issue can be solved by sensitizing only one gender. Let me tell you, if you really want to have a parity of gender, you equally, you, you need to equally sensitize both the genders. And that's why under the National Mensural Hygiene Policy, uh, we are not going to simply educate the girls and the women of the country. We are also trying to make the men and the boys understand so that they have the correct information on mensuration. There are no, and, and of course, there is a requirement, high requirement. And let me tell you guys, you won't believe, but in India, still in India, there are so many people having so many myth, stigma and gender issues around menstruation, not allowing girls to go to mandirs or any other religious places, not allowing, uh, you know, girls to do some activities just because they are having five days of menstrual cycles. So this is a natural process, biological process. And that's why extremely important to sensitize and destigmatize the issues around menstruation. So very logical. Very logical. Think it. Think this question not as a government policy. Think this question as a social issue. So right answer needs to be D. 1, 3 and 1, 2 and 3. You do not have to be very more specific. You just have to be logical while answering this question. Make sense? Yes. Now we have got the question number 99. Talks about India's nuclear energy production. Very, very important question. So nuclear energy production in India, which statement is correct? Let's try to figure out. Now, when you think of nuclear energy in India, just try to remember few facts. In terms of nuclear energy, nuclear energy is still India's fifth largest source of electricity. So of the total energy mix that we use in India, nuclear is still our fifth uh, source in terms of production. Nuclear let me tell you, many people have this confusion. Is nuclear renewable, sir? Or nuclear is non-renewable? Nuclear energy is considered to be part of renewable energy source. Yeah. Why? But there is no sense. Why do we consider nuclear as renewable? Because it does not emit the greenhouse gases like the fossil fuels, which are non-renewable. Make sense? That's why it is considered as a renewable source. Uh, in India, we have this aim to uh, generate at least 50% of the total electricity in India. We are aiming to produce from nuclear uh, by 2030. That is our aim. Right now, India's total uh, generation capacity as of 2023, we already have 43% energy coming from renewable sources. And let me tell you, India has set this target of net zero emissions and now we are trying to fulfill that uh, commitment by even expanding the source of nuclear energy in our energy mix. India's, and remember one, so as of now, how many nuclear states, nuclear reactors do we have? In India, you know, there are seven nuclear reactors which are fully functional in India. Out of the seven, if you want to name, I want, I want you guys to give me the name in the comment section box, guys. Do tell me in the comment the name of the seven nuclear reactors of India. 
so out of them one we have is uh, what we have is called the kakra par atomic power station in gujarat and recently that particular kakra par atomic power station has achieved criti uh, criticality what is criticality is important i'll explain but let me tell you this is india's second indigenous nuclear reactor that has got criticality criticality means what and why it is indigenous it is indigenous because because ultimately this reactor is built by india if this reactor is built by the nuclear power corporation of india npcil which is a public sector undertaking of the department of atomic energy this is absolutely important right now we just have mentioned the word criticality what is the meaning in terms of nuclear reactors what is the meaning of the term criticality criticality means what it is self sustaining state of the nuclear chain reaction it is important for any a nuclear reactor to keep its chain reaction on the criticality is important once the criticality is achieved it's a situation it's a it's a um, it's a state where you have the balance there's a criticality means a perfect balance between the neutrons that are being produced in the chain reactions and the neutrons that are being used so nuclear system becomes critical when neutron production equals the neutron loss and that is called the criticality if if the nuclear if the neutrons are more if the neutron loss is more than the production we call the situation as subcritical if the nuclear system is producing more neutrons than consuming then we call it as a supercritical but now you know the answer right so it all depends on the neutrons produced and neutrons lost well in india most of the nuclear reactors are pressurized heavy water reactors and let me let me tell you one very interesting fact the pressurized heavy water reactor the name itself says heavy water what is a heavy water guys heavy water here used as a coolant and a moderator heavy water is not the h2o which which is the normal water heavy water is is the isotopic form of the water called the d2o the deuterium oxide so d2o d d d2 is basically a heavy isotope of the h so in the in the nuclear reactor we are using this heavy water as a coolant and a moderator do remember that this is important the name says a lot pressurized heavy water reactor there are different different types of nuclear reactor we have fast breeder reactor also fast breeder reactors are those which are consuming less fuel and producing more fuel hai na they are fast breeder reactors now pressurized heavy water heavy water here is used as a coolant as a moderator so if you look at the statement so the first two statements are correct the second third fourth are incorrect why look at this question and this is very easy forget about the main fact forget just always start start this question by eliminating talking about india's nuclear reactor reactor production right now look at the statement 3 it says it the name itself says it the it is a pressurized heavy water we are using okay when the name itself says heavy water how you are going to use normal water as coolant make no sense but but for that you really have to be focused on reading word to word question and again in nuclear reactor operation criticality is difficult to is it is it a difficult situation no number one criticality is not difficult situation and criticality is for sure not about neutron exceeding the neutron loss no if neutron production is more we call it as super critical and criticality is all about the balance so at least number 3 number 4 could have been eliminated maybe i am not sure maybe you have confusion in statement number 2 i don't know if you are comfortable or if you remember the kakra par atomic is in gujarat is it really it has achieved criticality i mean this there is no guess work for that you need to have the factual information but and similarly with the first one for that only because if india is using nuclear as fifth largest then again this is purely fact based but here first and second correct third and fourth incorrect answer is only two the question i would uh, put it in the category of medium by eliminating the questions you could take a little bit of risk that brings us to the last question question number 100 guys this question is all about that you have to figure out which statement is not correct this question is about the biodiversity talks about very interesting point 
about the tigers of India. So which statement is not correct? Okay, be careful. So first of few things I need to discuss about the tigers of India. Let me tell you guys. Recently we got a we got a very interesting and very uh, alarming report. In fact, not interesting but alarming report. According to the Wildlife Protection Society of India, India recently has lost around 204 tigers alone in 2023. So you know India is known worldwide as a country that is promoting and protecting tiger like nothing like you know like like anything. But recently we have seen the loss of tigers and the reason why so many tigers have died in India. The major reasons being many of them died because of natural reasons. Even still the poaching and infighting continues being responsible for more than 200 deaths of tigers in India. Remember the tigers, uh, normally we have the white tiger, we have the normal uh, normal striped tiger and there, uh, there, are, there are a few tigers you have seen in the recent couple of uh, years where you have seen the black tiger, there was brown tiger also. So all these variations, color variations in tiger, uh, they, are, they are not a distinct species. Don't think they are distinct species uh, or some new species of tiger being discovered, no. All these brown, black, all these tigers are nothing but just there is a variation in the color because of some genetic variations that has happened in that particular uh, uh, t uh, in that particular species. Black tiger is nothing but it is a melanistic color variant of the tiger. So it's not a new species. So you may have you may have this question coming. So this tiger is a new species. They are not new species. And where in India we have this special black tigers found? Special black tigers are recorded only and only in the Simlipal Tiger Reserve, Odisha. Remember one more fact. Now, now considering this information, you may have a question coming on the Simlipal Tiger Reserve as well. Maybe it can be map based question or a normal MCQ can be there. So remember in, in Odisha only, Simlipal only we have this black tiger. Remember one more fact. Out of eight recognized subspecies of the tigers there are three so far which are extinct worldwide the bali tigers are completely extinct javan tigers completely extinct the caspian tigers are also extinct now now only five subspecies of tigers are alive where bengal tiger mainly in indian subcontinent the amur tiger that is there in the amur river region of russia china north korea south China tigers in South Central China, Sumatran tigers, Indo-Chinese tigers we find in South and East Asia. Uh, so only few are there. So but these three are no more, they are completely extinct. So this again, this fact is important for you. If you go back to the question guys, which statement is not correct? Every statement is correct. There is no problem with any statement. So statements are correct. But again, this question is again a fact based questions. Fact based, you, you have very less work, very less uh, guess workspace. Which statement is not correct? None, because all are correct. So remember all these questions, how to approach them, how to attempt them. This question was a medium level, could have been attempted. Otherwise, you can at least try to eliminate the information if there is any such information. So that is all from my side, guys. I really, really hope you have enjoyed this test. And with this, you have completed six tests. Congratulations, four more to go. So keep practicing with PMF IS and keep subscribing to our, uh, all the videos, keep sharing them and uh, definitely do not forget to give your feedback in the end of the video. Do let me know which particular part you have enjoyed the most. I hope you have learned a lot of new things and that new things are going to help you in the upcoming UPSC exam. That is all from my side. Take care. God bless you. Best wishes. See you uh, in the next test in a couple of days. Till then, study hard, prepare hard and give you 100% for the nation building and the UPSC services. Take care. God bless you. Jai Hind.